Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I expect a bit more enthusiasm than that because we're talking about a very exciting subject, which is commercial property. And we're going to be looking at commercial property. Is it a good thing to have as part of your investment portfolio? And more importantly, um, what are the opportunities, what are the threats for commercial property investing right now and over the next few years? So are you guys in the right place? Have you got your, uh, I didn't hear that, or are you here for something else? Are you guys in the right place? Okay, so if you've got uh, some questions, particularly on commercial property investing, then write them down. There'll be an opportunity for you to ask them of our esteemed panel. Um, I'm your host for this debate. My name is Ranjan Bhattacharya. I've been investing and developing properties and investing in commercial properties uh, for the last 30 years. Um, I'm the host of the Baker Street Property Meet, which is the UK's uh, largest property investors networking meeting. We meet on the last Wednesday of every month. We have more than 300 people turn up to our monthly meetups. You can find out more about that at bakerstreetpropertymeet.com. I also am an angel investor on the Sky TV show Property Elevator. And the session after this, uh, we're doing a live um, version of the Property Elevator TV show, where three people will pitch um, for funding for their property deals to six angel investors. So that's the next session on. But let's talk about this session and our panelists who are going to be here to uh, help you with your commercial property questions. Now, of course, if you want to invest in any property, you need the money. And uh, to help us with the money, we have Amy Schofield from Together Finance. Amy, can I invite you to the stage? <laughs> Big round of applause. Hi, Amy. Hello. Okay, tell us a little bit about your specialism, what you do. Uh, so I'm from a company called Together. Uh, we specialize in finance, so anything on any commercial properties, residential properties across the lot. So we do short-term bridging finance and longer-term finance as well. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. And also, Harriet Dunn from Titlesmith.com. Ready to see you, Harriet? Thank you. So, what's your, I mean, I know the company is Titlesmith.com, but you have other commercial yeah. uh, string to your bow. Yeah, so I'm a retired commercial property solicitor, 30 years' experience, and we now run a property education company training people how to create freehold leaseholds to value value. Brilliant, brilliant. So there'll be plenty of questions. And, and last but not least, Cam Devedi, Premier Education. Big hand for Cam Devedi. Hi, Cam. Good What's your specialism? Um, residential and commercial, um, ranging from £50,000 to around £4 million. We typically do seven projects on a monthly basis. And over the last decade, I've also been helping, assisting people to start in property and upskill and take it to the next level as well, scale as well. Brilliant, good to see you. Thank you. Okay, so folks, listen. Um, some of these guys might be doing residential buy to let, HMOs, serviced accommodation, rent to rent, all of this sort of stuff. Um, why should they bother with commercial property? What are the benefits? Why bother adding that to your portfolio? Harriet? Okay, I think for a lot of people when they get started in property, we're all trained or we all get started with doing the first buy to let we then often go into HMOs but also particularly at the moment there's an awful lot of competition and at the moment there are actually a massive way to make money investing in commercial property and that can be as small as one shop with a flat above or it can go all the way up to big industrial estate so it's something for everybody in this room that can do. Why would you bother with well, commercial? I mean I think we're all aware of the legislation changes that are happening um, Section 24, you know, the tenant tax, the final nail in the coffin, all that stuff going on. So commercial is um, a different strategy. There's a wider strategy that you can be developing within, within your property business. What are you seeing from your clients? We've definitely seen an increase of commercial properties, especially already tenanted commercial properties, just because of the return income on them. So it's a massive increase at the moment for us. Yes, yes, yes. I think it's a, it's a diversified income, isn't it? I mean, if you think about it, with residential property, you get rent every month. With commercial property, um, rent is often paid quarterly in advance. So it strengthens your cash flow if you have the right tenants. And of course, if you've got longer leases, you've got 10-year leases, 
you don't have to worry about getting a tenant every six months or every year. Uh, you've got longer, longer tenancies. And that can strengthen your portfolio. But there are some challenges, isn't it? I mean, it's not as rosy as all no. that. Are there any challenges, Harry? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge you've got to be aware of, and it's often missed when you're sort of doing your calculations and your Excel spreadsheets, and it's business rates. You have to be really aware of the business rates because they can be up to 45 pence in the pound of the rent. But you can minimize that. That's not a reason to say no. But please look out for the business rates and what you're looking for. Let's get them to some smaller units, smaller units, and that's going to give you sort of like the HMO income for commercial. But um, we're in a recession. Yep. The internet has changed everything. Yep. You know, there's less need for office spaces. Yep. People are working at home. And even, um, I mean, in our commercial portfolio, we're having people that are renting offices. Yep. And then at the end of their 10-year lease, they're actually wanting half the space. From home. Because they don't need filing cabinets anymore. No, it's all don't. in the cloud. No one has monitors which are that deep anymore, so the desk's a lot smaller. So people are doing more with less office space. Yep. And then with shops, you don't need so much spaces to display products on shelves. Yep. That's all been replaced uh, by warehouses. And in recessions, businesses are contracting anyway. So where are the opportunities? In so the opportunities, think about this. You've got to think about the human beings involved. And think about your local small high street. And I always joke, <coughs> you can't send your children to nursery on, nursery on the Amazon. You can't get your hair cut on Amazon. You can't get your dog groomed on Amazon. So you think about the street where you live. You think what local me people need in their community. Not everybody can go and do a big shop at the supermarket in their car every week. A lot of people will go every single day because they've got three, four pounds a day. So think about what your local community needs on that street. I mean, maybe it's not appropriate, but I have a client who actually specializes in providing accommodation for funeral homes. You know, you can't, you can't raise your children, you know, uh, on, on the internet. So just think what is needed in this area for this local community, especially the communities that are probably a little bit poorer and can't afford to go out shopping in big stores. Where do you see the commercial property opportunities? So what we're doing is um, like small towns work really well um, and semi-commercials are a very easy transition for investors. What do you call a semi-commercial? So semi-commercial, so um, as a nutshell, think of a, a shop with a flat above and in a smaller town or a satellite town around large cities, what you'll find is that that is a semi-commercial where you've got that residential element already. The big mistake that many investors make is they start to develop and start to convert those. But in smaller towns, in, in medium-sized towns, that doesn't actually work. However, when you've got a residential element to it already, you don't need to convert anything. So in effect, you've got that buy-to-let income, if you like, coming from the residential already. So if you're like me, what you call the, 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 the commercial element is your Brucey bonus. So your below market value becomes the commercial element, and that is your added value to that property and your added income. Amy. Yeah, so just to expand on that a bit, so obviously we have a lot of um, people buying semi-commercial properties too, um, and it is like a massive interest to people as well. Just the thing for us at the moment is interest rate rises, and they are happening, um, and they are happening across the market, so for everyone, but it does mean that there is less appetite for the bigger lenders like your banks and your high street lenders, um, and that there'd be more specialist lenders who are now in the market with commercial term products or bridging products as well. Now that's an interesting point, Amy, because um, I mean, commercial properties are not valued in the same way as residential properties. Residential properties are valued on a bricks and mortar basis and on a comparables basis. But with commercial properties, it's all about the rental cash flow that they produce. And as interest rates rises, um, the yield premium that people expect, investors expect, over interest rates kind of increases. So when interest rates were low, people would be quite happy with a 6% yield on a commercial buy-to-let. But today, as interest rates are rising, then people expect a higher yield on a commercial property buy-to-let. So presumably, that means that commercial buy-to-let values have fallen or will fall as interest rates rise. Do you see a link like that, Amy? Yeah, I suppose you can do. I think it's, it's, 
it's difficult to say because obviously you have a lot of longer term leases on in place for commercial properties as well so it really just depends on the property and it really depends on the area and where you're buying as well and what the the need is obviously you've got retail which might not be as popular in some areas but then you do have like your smaller businesses which yeah. are massively important your nurseries they're so popular right now because people see that you can't send your yeah. kids to yeah. nursery on amazon i love that <laughs> i think that's quite interesting because if you think about the human beings that are going to live and work in that area that is a key thing that the banks are looking at. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at, if you decide to create a build, buy a building, maybe because of the business rate, split it down in two units, and you get complementary uses in those two, build, those two units, so it could be sort of a hairdresser and the nail salon, when the bank comes to lend, they know their complementary use, uses. You don't put in two hairdressers, if you see what I mean. And because you've done the research when you've been buying to say, yeah, absolutely, I know there's demand. And the point that you made about the residential above, it's perfect. Because then if you want to, split them out into two long leases, get buy-to-let lending on the top, which solves the problems you've talked about with the yield. So buy-to-let lending on the top, commercial valuation on the bottom. So it gives you that flexibility. So I agree with what both of you are saying, yeah? So if I can jump in there, I mean, it would be useful, wouldn't it? It would be useful to actually clarify, you know, residential valuations, bricks and mortar, and clarify actual investment valuations. Would that be useful, team? That's a question for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no? Yeah. So, you know, because, you know, we can, um, you know, the elephant in the room sometimes is, you know, what are these valuations? People don't tend to understand mm -hmm. them. So I like to make things simple. So residential valuations, bricks and mortar, you're, you're probably familiar with. You know, the property next door has sold, land registry has said it's sold for 200,000. So the value comes in and they say, right, this property is like for like, so it's 200,000. Yeah? With um, investment valuations, the myth is that it's typically 10 times the rental of the commercial unit. But actually, that's not true. Uh, the truth is, it's a, the value is a little bit of a law unto themselves, what, what we're finding with our valuations. However, the value will come in and there's a key calculation that you can do initially so you know what the rental is going to be. So if I just shout it out for you. So that is the annual rent divided by a gross yield number. Now, the number will come from the lender. And uh, in my experience, it tends to be between 6% to 10%. And you're only using that number. So the annual rental, whatever that is, let's say it's, 10, let's say it's 10K, divided by the annual rent, uh, the, the gross yield number. So let's say in a small town, the number will be higher. In a larger town, typically it will be lower. The more stronger the covenant, the number will be lower that is used. The, 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 the weaker the covenant, the higher the number, uh, in a nutshell. So let's say that's 10, so that'd be 10 divided by 10, multiplied by 100, and you actually get the commercial valuation. Now that's a great place to start from, However, in my experience, when the valuer comes around, mm. like what I said, they're a little bit of a law unto themselves. I don't know if you found this, Renton. So they will come along and they'll say, right, we're going to give you a 90-day valuation. Or we're going to give you a 180-day valuation. I mean, even the financing we got from you guys, surveyors come along and have valuations. We'll ask for that figure. Yeah. yeah. And um, no, they'll, do, they'll do that. So what is a 90-day valuation, just for clarity? So the valuer is actually assessing Cam, that I unit. I know you've got time for a full seminar on that. But, <laughs> right. um, OK, we get commercial values are dependent much more on the, on the cash flow. Um, but what I wanted to ask Amy is lender appetite. Because businesses are failing, it's a recession and all of that. How, uh, if someone signs up to a 10-year lease, say, uh, what is the lender appetite for commercial lets? Yes, so it, it, it's dependent on what the business is, and, and that's what it comes down to. If you're going to come to us with a, a with big shopping mall, we've got to realistically think about, well, who's going to be going to a shopping mall? All fast fashion, people buying on ASOS, you know, there's no need for that. Where, where, do you know, a 10-year lease for that, is it really necessary? However, someone comes to you for a 10-year lease for, a, let's say, a nursery, and there's always going to be a need for that. So really, it's, it's what business you're bringing to us, what security you're bringing to us, and what business is being run out of that, to whether the appetite is going to be there. What lender you go to is really going to depend together are always going to have an appetite for something because you've got your building, we've got our security. Whether we lend as much as other securities with a better business in does depend. When you go to your high street lenders, your banks, that they are going to be a bit more cautious because they can be, um, because they have other streams of income. So it really does depend. I mean, this is the other question I wanted to ask uh, all the panel really, is on tenants, commercial tenants, because it used to be 
that if you had a prestigious name in your commercial property as a tenant, in a high street coffee shop or something like that, um, it used to be seen as prestige, an A1 premium tenant. And mom and pop type operators um, were considered lesser tenants. Um, but I think COVID, well not I think, the, the facts show this, COVID changed that all around. Um, many big companies, many big companies were well able to afford it, played silly games with their landlords and, and used clever lawyers to basically get out of paying rent over COVID. Whereas the smaller tenants who leased the, these shops and offices in their own names, acting as guarantors, actually paid all the way throughout. Has that COVID experience changed um, the viewpoint of what is considered an A1 premium tenant? Has yeah, it? I, I would agree with you. I think it absolutely has. I think some of the state mistakes people make is, let's, let's, just, let's just put it from this perspective. You want a tenant that's going to pay the rent. So you have to be not a little bit harsh, but a little bit hard. You probably don't want a complete newbie that's starting a brand new business. But if someone's been running a business successfully for 10 years, absolutely, why not? Always give them though, at least a seven-year lease because the banks, I think maybe you'll back me up and they're going to want at least a seven-year lease. Always give them that and make sure that if it is someone, maybe it's a bit harsh, if it is a sole trader, get some sort of guarantee. It's similar a bit like to your buy to let with the homeowner guarantees. So the bank then knows that you've done your due, your due diligence. And the other thing I would say to you is always, always put your rent paid quarterly in advance because from experience as a commercial solicitor, one of the things we actually had to report to the bank was how often is the rent paid. And I think they prefer the quarterly to the monthly. So try and avoid monthly. Always ask quarterly in the advance. Then the other thing I'd say to you to help with the banks is when you're negotiating your leases, if there is more than one unit in there and you're going to do a service charge, collect your service charge quarterly in advance. So with that, you're then going to your bank saying, here's a tenant, been going 10 years, they pay quarterly in advance, they pay the service charge quarterly in advance, and the reason is, if they can't pay in advance, you've got three months, haven't you? You've got notice. So I don't know if you, that, that what you two guys think about that. I mean, um, I totally agree with the seven years. So uh, that's seven years. By the way, we won't go into 90-day valuations, 180-day valuations today. We'll do that another day. Um, but in terms of the leases, seven years is a key number. It is a key so, number. So because over seven years, it's got to be registered at land registry. Um, so we keep it below seven years. Um, what I tend to do with the, you call it the mom and pops, right? Say again? Uh, you call them mom and pops, do you call them? What do you call them? Mom and pops, yeah. yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, people just starting out, people that are, you know, really good at what they do, they've got own occupied businesses. Um, they, they tend to be really good tenants. And I always tend to give them a three year break clause. Because if someone's starting a business, the last thing you want to do is sort of hold them in for a seven year term where they may not find that their business works after three years. Does that make sense? Because you can always find good tenants. So I always give them a bit of a get out clause, uh, personal thing, uh, three year. Because what you'll find in three years is one of two things will happen. Either that business will expand and they'll go on to larger mm. units, or unfortunately that business uh, will fail and, and they'll, you know, uh, that'll be that. So um, you know, we like to have a seven year lease with a three year break clause, which works really well. And always ask for an upward only rent review. Um, which of course is in your favor and also it's in your tenants favor because if they are there for that time frame They're actually making money aren't they? So it's okay for them to pay a little bit more so you can build these things into place uh, When it comes to rent reviews, you can have upward only rent reviews um, You can have the retail price index rent reviews as well You can also have CPI rent reviews as well now if you're dealing in satellite towns or smaller towns then sometimes it doesn't really make that much difference because the rent in real terms ain't going to really increase that much in difference anyway. And you've built in the fact that you've got no money in the deal in the first place because you've done your numbers correctly. I'll be quiet now, Ranjan. Amy. Hopefully that's useful for you. Yeah, I, I will agree with what both of you are saying. I can't really comment on rent reviews and stuff, but in terms of if we're a lender and you've got something, you've got a strong seven year lease, we're going we're gonna to consider that as a security. It's going to be a better case for us to, to, to put to the underwriters, et cetera, for us to lend on. I think um, one of the things that I'd like to have a discussion on is something which I think has gone largely unnoticed in mm -hmm. commercial property by a lot of people. And that's because it happened right before the COVID shutdown, and then we've had a recession afterwards. And I'm not sure whether it's been fully noticed, but just before COVID shutdown, <coughs> we had the biggest change to the planning system that we've seen since 1948 for commercial property. 
and that was the introduction of commercial usage class E. It used to be that if you had a bank and you wanted to convert it to a restaurant, you'd have to apply for planning permission. If you had a, um, uh, a grocer's shop and you wanted to get a dentist in there, you'd have to apply for planning permission. But what the government did just before COVID is they smashed all these usage classes together into one usage class. So now, if you've got an old bank building, you can make it into a, a nursery, you can make it into a dentist practice, you can make it into a restaurant without asking the council for their planning permission. So this change happened just before COVID, um, and I think has completely changed commercial property buy to let forever. But then straight after COVID, we've pretty much been in recession. And I think the true effects of that change are yet to happen. What do you feel about usage class E and its impact on commercial property well, and investment? I'm so glad you asked that question because I sometimes feel that that's, I rant on and on about that all the time. And I think it's absolutely massive and I think it's misunderstood. And I think it's misunderstood because people didn't realise you had to apply for a full planning permission to change your views you used to. Now, you will, I want you all to picture your local high street or somewhere where you live. You'll probably find there's a, a property that's always empty and the ground floor probably gets a bit of a charity shop or something. And the chances are the owner of that property does not know about the changes in the changes and they still think they have to get planning permission to go ch change it to something else. And I think that is where there's a massive opportunity. So I think you're 100% right. And I think it's just been completely missed off the news. But I would kind of stay. Let's just keep it here. Yeah. Because that enables these people to go buy them. We kind of don't want the owners of these properties to know because as soon as they know. But do you know what's a shame? I think it's a real shame because they brought it in to revive the high street, and because it's been ignored, it's not being used. You're absolutely right. I've actually seen, I mean, with mm. committed development, I've seen people put in a planning application I know, absolutely. for a change of use, and they yeah. get rejected, but they don't realize they, they don't can have just to do put anyway. in the planning in the first place. Or they leave it empty yes. because they were rejected five years ago. This seller might have a bit of money, is not bother, and the, sh the high street is left empty. So if you can find these, and they're ever so easy to find, aren't they? As I say, we'll just say it quietly, we'll just keep it a secret. Are you making a lot of noise about Class E? <laughs> Class E, I mean, you, you can't help it, can you? You can't help it because it's, 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 it's such a good opportunity. So, for example, um, we've got a building in South Woodford. So this is a three story building. Three separate titles. I know you're, you like. Titles oh yeah, playing. absolutely. So th these are titles split already. Um, but th this was an empty, vacant property. Uh, nice location, uh, beautiful looking building actually. A uh, bit like the uh, Spanish villas. Where have you been recently? You've just been on Seville. holiday. Seville. <laughs> Seville. Very right, nice. Yeah. Right. So uh, lo lovely looking properties. Um, but it was empty. It was an empty property. So what we've done is we've actually rented that property out. Now previously the, the ground floor was used as an office. Now, the middle floor we actually occupy as our offices, and the upstairs is our training suite. Um, the ground floor, we don't need that space. So what we've done with the ground floor is we've basically bought the property at one and a half million, and then the downstairs has been rented, rather than an office, it's now, um, oh, I can't say it, what are they, cryo, cryo, cryo practice. Yeah, one of them, right? <laughs> so they're one of them. And what that's done is that's actually increased the rental value so the initial rental for the office, the previous uh, occupier was 17,000. We've now got the rental value to market rental, uh, high, high market rental, good market rental, which is just over 35K. Now, what we've done with that is, as we were discussing earlier, we've got investment valuations. I won't go into 90-day valuations, 180-day valuations. However, we've got a valuation from there. And then we've got funding at the higher investment valuation. Now, how have we been able to do that? How can you do that? Is because what you guys are sharing, right? That it's about the use class order has been changed. The use class order is now a class E, so it doesn't have to be an office. It can be the chiropractor, that one. Chiropractor. Chiropractor, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah can be one of them. So, so this is that's been, use class E in force. So this has been massive. I mean, a lot mm. of, I mean, like for example, we see offices and they're converted to gyms. And that's because they're all under the same usage class now that doesn't require planning permission. Has the introduction of usage class E uh, improved or had any effect on commercial property values? Yeah, I could say it has done really. In, in terms of finance, we have noticed a massive uplift in people who want to lend and buy these properties. So it is something maybe to the right, more experienced people that they do know about it, maybe not 
maybe more and more people need to know about this, um, which is what we have noticed an uplift in commercial purchases, so they can be changed. And it is something our development team, they consider development finance for too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, Harriet, I mean, this is a question I get asked a lot. Okay. Um, and, and I have my own answer to this. But no when pressure. You, when you do commercial property, yes. I think it's a good idea to have a mixed use. Yes. I think it's a good idea because you have diversified cash flow. Yes. Then you end up with a building with maybe some commercial units yeah. or like we're doing one in Leicester at the moment, three commercial units, eight flats. Yes. So is it a good idea to split the title for each one of those units yes. separately and remortgage them as individual units or just get one um, uh, mortgage on the whole freehold. What are the pros and cons I, of I doing it, both? I think it goes back, first of all, it goes back to the first thing you said, asset protection. Because your property, your property market cycle goes like this, your commercial market, so let's say for asset protection. What is being missed by nearly all investors out there is you have to appreciate that if you title split correctly and create the, the correct leases on there, you're going to get a 20 or 30% uplift in value from not title splitting. That's 20 to 30% uplift, assuming you've renovated it. We're not saying you make money just by doing the leasehold. So, but it's more than that. It's not just that. You then have a choice. You can either then go for individual comparable valuations, which you, we can do, or you can take the whole thing and do commercial valuations. So you choose at the time that's best for the developer which valuation, but it's better than that, and it's almost more important than that, is let's say you've got that property, and I know it's your property, so you're making plenty of money, you've done your due diligence, but let's just say it was somebody who was new to this, and actually it's not working out too well. The only people they can sell that building to is another investor who will want a discount, because you'd want a discount, wouldn't you? Mm. Whereas if they had split the title correctly, there's individual flats we're going to put on right move, and it also is something else which people don't realize, those commercial properties could be going in your SaaS. So you can have some buy-to-let properties over here, cash flowing, beautiful for our money today in our pockets. We can have some commercial property in our SaaS for our future and our legacy to leave on to our children. And we can have a couple of commercial properties that we're going to hold back in case we fancy that world cruise when we hit 60. I agree. It does give you a little bit of flexibility. But Amy, isn't it a right pain in the ass because I've got to have uh, get a lawyer for each uh, to do all the individual leases and I've got to pay valuation fees for individual properties I've got to, the lender arrangement fees and all of that and I've got to maintain all this paperwork as well yeah I understand what you're saying however what what have you said is right so anything with over eight units or more in so if they're all residential and they're over eight units they're going to be classed as com it's going to be classed as commercial property so you're going to be paying higher commercial rates split them up have them a single, and you're going to be paying lower residential rates. So you've got to think of, you've got to balance up the costs and what's the right thing for you to do, haven't you? Cam, have you ever found any issues with, if you're refinancing um, uh, separate units in a building, then one lender will say, well, we're not lending more than on two flats. One lender will say we're overexposed on this, and then you end up having to chase multiple lenders? Yeah, and it's really important that you get the right lender for what, you're wanting, what you want to do. So, look, the overview sounds great. You know, you, you really got to look at the detail. Um, so, f for some, some of my students, um, I mean, they're jumping into this kind of stuff. And to be fair, there's this myth that you have to have done a, a gazillion projects like us before you actually jump into this. Actually, that ain't the truth. You know, you can jump into what you want to jump into, provided you're following the steps that you need to follow. So, one of them is the lender. So, look at the lender's appetite for what you're wanting to do. Because uh, one of the myths is, yep, you know, you're tied to split it. You've got a commercial, uh, you've, you've created a, a company for the freehold, and then you've got a leasehold, which is another one of your companies. But you see, the lenders, some of them, when they will look at that, and they say, well, hang on a minute. You're the director on both the company and the leasehold. So they will pick up on these things, okay? So I'm not saying they won't lend. In my experience, they do lend. But you really got to look at the lender's appetite and check that, I would suggest, with your mortgage broker right at the beginning before you do anything with your title split. Um, and you know, great, great uh, strategy, by the way. Uh, we do this as well. Um, what I'm saying is you get your ducks in a row correctly, and the financing element you want to check in right at the beginning. Yeah, I agree. So are they, yeah, so they multi-unit block? Will they, take, will they take on a multi-unit block under one freehold? Will they look at the leases and uh, accept you as a director? What are the requirements? What can you get? That's why we've got you. 
and we have an appetite for everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just thinking, circle back to our very first question here, because um, you guys have made it sound so complicated, all this commercial property malarkey. Oh, you know, now with permitted development rights, I can convert the shit out of these things to residential. Mm -hmm. So why don't I just do that and not bother Harriet? So I agree with you completely. I don't see the difference. In fact, I think a buy-to-let shop is easier than a buy-to-let house. Because a buy-to-let shop, I'm going to give them a seven-year lease. They're going to pay me quarterly in advance. And you know what we're going to do? Well, you know this. Yeah, so if they don't pay the rent, do I serve a notice? Do I serve a notice? No, I change the locks. So to me, a oh, buy-to-let shop... Tell us more about that. You know, I've got a residential oh. tenant who hasn't paid. Uh, I'm having a bit of hassle, but is it as easy to get them out with commercial as a lawyer? What, for a commercial prop a tenant a commercial out of a commercial tenant, property? How do you get yeah, them you out the and pay? So, in, so, so you have to use it. You have to use a good commercial property solicitor, not me, I'm retired, who do not use a lease that your friend has lent you, or I'll come and tell you all off. In that lease, you know this, there is a clause that says, if you do not pay your rent within 21 days, we will lock, change the locks. Not only will we change the locks, if you don't collect your possessions within 14 days, we will sell them at auction, go, off you go. So I'm, not, I'm talking there, so uh, uh, just a nice shop with a flat above. Get the flat above because, as you said, yeah, mixed use is what you want. Get that flat on a long lease, the shop on a long lease. Buy to let, no different from a buy to let house, and way easier than HMOs. No, I, I, mean, I said that question <laughs> tongue-in-cheek, actually. I'm a big <laughs> believer in keeping some commercial. Cam, what's your view? Well, I'll say there's, there's yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, there's three key parts to this, though, that you want to really be aware of. So the first is be aware of the CRAR system. Yep, C-R-A-R, the CRAR system. So what we kind of alluded to already, that's the CRAR system working for you in your favor. Secondly is to be making sure that your leases are outside of the 1954 Act. So uh, I'll just say that for now rather than turning to whole seminar. Um, so that means that you've got more safety and security because you want to be safe and secure with what you do as well, right? And the third aspect is having the human approach. Um, what I mean by that is the last thing we want to do is to lock the doors on tenants. So, of course, what we would do is have a mediation process. And it's quite interesting, actually, because, you know, just having, being able to speak to your tenants and actually finding out what is going on in their business, how you can assist them, create a payment plan, you know, help them through the process, just be a little bit more relaxed and a bit more gentle with them so that, you know, at the end of the day, if you lock the doors, what's going to happen? You're going to look for another tenant. And trust me, it's going to take you another minimum three to six months to find a good tenant who's a paying tenant. So why not keep the tenant that you already got but have a mediation process there? So if you assess these three key aspects, you know, you'll be in good standing. And Amy, a slightly tailored question for you. Um, I've got a mixed-use building, which is mixed commercial use. Mm -hmm. And I've got a mixed-use building, which is a little bit of resi and a little bit of commercial. Which one of those is more... Um, do, do the lenders have a greater appetite for and therefore fav more favourable terms? Definitely the split resi commercial is definitely a higher appetite. There's less looked into, obviously, when we're looking at it because you have got them residential tenants in. Obviously, you, you, you're you going to send it, when you've got your lease agreement for your full commercial, it's going to be looked at and it's going to be looked at by the head underwriter um, just to be really, to make sure there's nothing in there that can catch together out just in case of repossession or anything like that. So it is definitely easier to there's going to be less looked into when getting finance on the, on the mixed use. Now, just before I um, uh, ask for questions on the floor, I'll just say one thing about commercial property, which we haven't really touched on so far, which is the, um, uh, the, the intensity of the management effort required to manage a, a commercial portfolio over a residential portfolio. And that's something that we haven't really discussed. But from my own experience, I will tell you guys that um, about 80% um, of our rent roll comes from residential and about 20% comes from commercial. The 80% um, requires four full-time people to manage. The commercial element is something that I do myself and it takes no more than a couple of hours a week. It needs no repairs or maintenance at all because the tenants are responsible for that. And it's just a little bit of um, um, paperwork, which mostly my VA does and sorts out and my lawyer does the, does the legal stuff. So the intensity of the operational management required for a commercial portfolio is far less than residential buy-to-let, much less than HMO or anything like that. 
Any comments on that? On yeah, what I said? think you said the key word there, which was you just got to make sure you've got a really good lawyer drawing up a proper FRI lease to make, which is a full repairing. FRI, yeah. FRI lease, which is a full repairing insuring lease. So as the landlord, you repair, you insure, and you charge, but the full cost to the tenant. The only thing to be really careful of is if you've got a, a, an agent when negotiating the lease who is a bit flexible and says, oh, no, you only have to pay a cap service charge or you don't have to pay your full share. Don't let them do that. Um, so, yeah, back you up completely on that. Mm. OK, let's go to the floor. Who's got some questions? Who's got a burning commercial property question for our panel? Can we get the mic to this gentleman at the front? What's your name, sir? Hi, everybody. My name is Hafiz, Hafiz Chowdhury. Hafiz, what's your question? Um, so this is more to yourself. Uh, it's about lending. Yeah. So I was recently looking at, uh, there's an old Lloyds Bank where I live. It's closed down for about six, seven years. And it was being sold for 1.4 million. Dead, dead property, known been there for seven years. Um, and it had planning permission for about 14 one-bedroom flats on top as well. Now, uh, the purchaser wanted a only cash, only offers. Mm -hmm. Now, when he says cash, it doesn't really mean cash, but money available straight away. Yeah? So I had two issues there. Number one, I didn't have the lending agreed. Number two, I wouldn't be able to do it on my own. Therefore, other people would have been coming with me. So my two questions are, number one, how quick, assuming that the property is good, can we get these sort of decisions made with the lenders you have? And number two, how open are you to sort of have, say, let's say there's four or five investors together to come in and purchase that property and the development funds as well? So for the purchase, steady easy. And bear in mind, my company, my team, the, what I do day in, day out is deal with auction finance. Auction finances, you get 28 days, sometimes 14 day completion time frames, and we do get them on commercial securities as well, and we can actually adhere to that. It, it depends who you go to as a lender to how quick they can turn around, but if you come to someone like Together, we definitely can do that for you. We can do it in the short completions. You need to make sure you've got your solicitor and they know what they're doing. That is the biggest thing, because if your solicitor can't do it, then we can't do it. We've got to work together to get it done and the property's got a value up as well. So we need to get a full RICS valuation on the property and that has got to be valued up as well. In terms of having the multiple directors, absolutely fine, do it in a company name, you've got multiple directors, it's not a problem, we can do that for you as well. Sorry, what was your other question? Um, Is that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, th those are the two main ones. Yeah. Um, would you also need personal guarantees from the directors as well? We would, yeah. Now, yeah. I think um, I'll just add to that. Um, if you have got multiple people in a directorship of a company, I would set that entity up first. That takes a little bit of time, because in the time scale to actually purchase the property, particularly when they want the deal done quickly, um, uh, it, that will be a, a, a delaying a factor. The other thing I'd say is the market has changed. I think um, we are moving now from a uh, very much a seller's market to a buyer's market, and that is transitioning. So when agents are still saying, oh, they're looking for cash offers, we're looking to stuff now, it doesn't necessarily they will mean they will get it. They may get cash offers, but at a lower price. So you can give them nearer to what they want by delaying and slowing down the timetable to actually purchase, which gives you a lot more flexibility in the way you fund it. And finally, you, you really want to bring that deal to the next session, Property Elevator, because <laughs> that's when you can get equity funding into your deal mix, which is an essential component for financing in today's market. The other part of the question was development finance on top. Is there a limit? compared to the, is it, do we just look at GDV or Yes, or so what? you can lend up to 100% of the bill cost depending what the GDV is. So obviously usually up to sort of 70% of the GDV. But again, it depends on the project, it depends what experience you've got as a developer. So all that is, added, you, you know, we would take that as a case. As a purchase, as a, as a, to get it over the line as a cash buyer so is what people will call day. you, even though, because you can get it you done in 30 days, you can get the purchase done get that and then go down the route of development finance and have a look at what that will entail. Also, you find valuers are also downvaluing. So um, 
for example, we had a, a sale agreed recently, and uh, the valuer came along, and uh, because of the market, as we're discussing, they downvalued it. So you always got that recourse to go back to the seller and say, look, it's a risk valuation. The value, valuer has valued it as this amount. Um, so it's a, it's a great way to negotiate that after, uh, after as well. And uh, yeah, I agree with what Ranjan said there. You know, people can say cash offers. However, who's actually willing to make a cash offer is a different thing. Let's just um, probe something there with Harriet. Thank on you. The, uh, well, did I do really good at staying quiet? Probably. <laughs> I, I could have worded that better. I'm sorry. Um, uh, the uh, lend uh, valuations. I think with commercial property, there is far more scope for lend, uh, valuers' opinions to come in. And uh, I, I, we've just had a situation with one of my students who got a down valuation based on some silly assumptions the valuer made and then literally one week later from a different valuer got a £500,000 difference in valuation simply because of the way the valuer treated a hotel. I mean, they were, in this story they were getting, um, that because this was um, not a hotel that had a, had a, per, a dedicated staff on site, um, they didn't class it as a hotel, whereas the next valuer did. Um, and that made a massive yeah. differentiation. So you can change the values and, get a, and spin the bottle again in well, many respects. Well, you can, but, and, but more than that, and it goes back to that you were saying of getting your ducks in a row. You, you, when you go to buy a property, you should have done your due diligence and done your research, and you should almost, like we talked about, walk in the shoes of your tenants, and your, you should be walking in the shoes of your valuer when, you go, when you're actually buying it. So you can look at it and say, OK, let's get my own value on board earlier, start putting together valuation packs, and look at the thing you, you mentioned, and look at different ways you can package it. You said part of that was residential, so are you going to ask them to value that separately? Are you going to look at that commercial ground floor and look at it being into small units? So if you do your research and your prep, you can be ready for that value. You don't just wait for them to turn up and wander around whistling. So I think a lot of it is about Absolutely. due diligence and prep. And then the other, just very quickly, because I know we're out of time, I wanted no, no. to say, so you mentioned about the finance, if you're working with lots of people together, can I just say, whenever any of you are doing JVs, please, please do shareholders agreements. Please, please do shareholders agreements. Don't go into businesses, uh, and obviously you'll cover this on the next session, but you know, think carefully about who you're going into business with as well. It's not just about property, it's, it's about your life and building a better lives for yourselves. Exactly. Mm. Um, this lady here. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Christine Hallett. Um, just two questions, if I may. First to Amy, do you consider lending for commercial property through pension schemes? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. And second for Harriet and Cam. Um, you mentioned SAS. Yes. Um, obviously for company sorry, directors. Can I just, uh, 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 before you go into the second scheme, sorry, second no, question. Sorry. Could you just summarise if there are any differences in the lending to pensions as opposed to companies and individuals? There is, but we more cover it with our solicitors, so I don't necessarily know the specifics in about. In terms of loan to value, um, stuff like that's absolutely fine. We can lend to a pension scheme. We might, when we go down the legal route, we might get a bit more for the solicitors, but that's, that's what they deal with. Okay, so your second question, that's yeah. Okay, the second question <coughs> is, obviously from a SAS point of view, which is focused at company directors and partners, um, but from a self-invested personal pension for individuals. Um, what do you think the benefits of investing in commercial property through a pension scheme so are? If you've got a SAS or a SIP, but I'm not a financial advisor, the advantage is looking for something like a mixed-use property, with the commercial on the ground floor and the residential on the, in the top. So the only, way, the only way to get that commercial property into your SAS is to do a title split. So you split away the commercial into your SAS or your SIP, okay? Slightly different rules, slightly different. Also remember there's different lending rules for SAS and a SIP. You split it away and see that as the future. But bear in mind, you can access that at 50. Then put the residential into your buy-to-let, get the bricks and mortar valuation, get cash flow for today. And if you want to, and then if you, if you might come to a point, you think I'll just sell the SAS bit one off or whatever. And of course, by putting it into the SAS, so important, it allows you to pass it on to your children. So it's SAS, brilliant. But when you put it into a SAS, um, you have to wait until you're really old before you can get your money, your you hands on it. You can just sell it. So my amazing business partner, Rachel Knight, amazing lady. She bought a property in her SAS. She gained planning, 
changed. She ch I don't even know if she changed the locks. She got planning permission. She then sold it. She got an uplift of £200,000 into her SAS. Didn't lift it, didn't even do anything other than, well, I say she didn't. She got planning, which was amazing. So she sold it. She then had another, so she then had a shopping pot of £200,000 in addition to everything else. She's now out shopping. She's in the middle of buying another commercial property today as we speak, which will be split as well. So she's living it and walking it today, buying in this market with a SAS. SAS is a very, very powerful. Um, anyone else? Yes, you, sir. Yeah, hi, my name's uh, Michael. So you touched on the changing landscape of, of the high street, I suppose, and the change for, you know, so the big, I've got two questions which are related. One is, what's going to happen to the high street shops that we are predicted to be closing down? I haven't seen too much evidence of that yet, but there is that general prediction. Uh, what you, the panel thinks about that, and then also the whole situation with voids with commercial properties. Because I'm conscious that you then pick up business rates and so on, responsibilities. Um, so, again, does there appear to be more risk with the whole void responsibilities? Um, anyway, shall I just go first? Go for it. So, I think is this something? I'm going to assume it's something you're looking to buy as opposed to own. The first thing you have to do is stand outside and be, the me and be a meerkat. And if it's a very deprived area, if there's not much going on, it's very run down, there is probably going to be very little use for that property, so we're going to walk on by. But let's just assume it's an average family, average area, and it's a nice run of little shops that people can get to, maybe on the way home from school. There's going to be a, in the, is there a demand, and what is there a demand for? Is it the laundrette? Is it the convenience store? With, but it's going to have to have flats above because fundamentally there are not enough homes in this country. And unless people like you create these apartments and these homes because no one else is going to do it, and if you think about it, if we're not going to have cars and we're not going to have 15 minute cities, we're going to be very much like Hong Kong and we're going to be living above, we're going to be living above the shops, a bit like in London. So I think you just have to be the meerkat and think what is the demand in this area and if there isn't, walk away. But I'll guarantee there will be for some, most areas there is for something, even if it is the corner shop. And going back to what you were saying about the covenant strength of the tenant, there's lots of companies out there now that specialise in wanting small areas, whether it's a, um, a large company or small companies, convenience stores, really. Oh, mm. the secondary, secondary parades, tertiary mm. parades are working so well right now. Um, if we look at the businesses, most of it's gone to Amazon, isn't it? Anything that's kind of a product, you can buy on Amazon so much more cost effectively. So, you know, whether you want to assist the community or not, um, you find that you'll be assisting the community because you're bringing these tired properties back into good use. Um, uh, one of my favorites is semi commercials. We do developments as well, but I do love the semi commercials because you do get that retained income. And you're bringing these units back into the community, um, which is brilliant, isn't it, when you think about it? Uh, nice, nice byproduct, right? Yeah. There is a lot of demand, but I think um, I like your meerkat uh, phrase. And you do I, have I even to, do that for you. <laughs> you do have to look at, um, you know, the deprived areas are a challenge. And I, I have a sort of, uh, the coffee, cup, how much is a cup of coffee test? So if you're in a high street where a cup of coffee is less than a pound and you get it, get it in a polystyrene cup, you know, like it's uh, at the end of The Apprentice where the losing team goes to have their discussion. If they're cafes like that, then it's probably not the best. But if the cup of coffee is going to cost you three quid, then that's probably an area where um, there is the affluence in the local population uh, to make it a place where businesses want to go to sell services. Uh, and that's but one it, but of the key But if you see uh, voids, if you see empty properties anyway, um, do they regularly change? If you, if, you, if you see several in a high street, say it's, I don't know, 5%, 10% of the, of the street is in void situation, is that something to avoid, apart from the uh, ah. possibility of adding value with putting residential above and so no, on. The, 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 void, the, the, the question there was, if you see 5%, 10% voids in the street, is that something to avoid? Um, you have to find out why a property is empty. Uh, because you don't know. You know, a property, a, a, many times, a property has been let out on a 10-year lease. And a business has packed up after eight years. And what they're trying to do is re-let it just for the last remaining two years. 
So who the hell is going to come in there and refurbish that shop just for two years' security? You've got to find out the reason why that shop is empty. Because a shop that's empty is not the same as a shop that's available to let on a fresh 10-year lease. It's a very, very important point to and remember. The voids and the and people miss that. Anyone voids. else? Yeah, just be, you have to, right. So if you look at a property, you've got to be aware that the business rates can be an issue. However, please be aware that you can appeal business rates. It's actually quite easy to appeal business rates. And the next thing around is you can go around with a special business rate, rate surveyor and they will work out for you, right, shall we just take this down into three shops and then you might have no rates. It's just the poor person that was renting before didn't know. It's yes. a lack of education and knowledge. So they might have gone out of business because the rates were too high. And actually, if they put a partition down the middle, rented that out to somebody else, somebody there, there's no business rates. So it's lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. But that's why you're here listening to us, isn't it? Mm. OK, just to wrap up then, um, if I can just, uh, I'm going to take this lady at the back because she's put her hand up so straight. The last question. Then I'm going to ask you to give us, your, each of you, your top tip for people uh, in terms of opportunity for commercial property over the next couple of years. So it'll give you some time to think about that. Right, yes. so we have two uh, semi-commercial properties in um, a company. We also have a, a development company as well. With one of the semi-commercial properties, we have a shop and three flats. Um, we're coming to the end of fixed term with um, Hampshire Trust, um, and the rates have gone sky high. Um, so one of the chaps here um, I spoke to today suggested title splitting. If I were to retain all of the titles, though, um, once they're split into 999-year lease, uh, peppercorn rent, etc., cetera, um, ground rent, um, then would I need to set up a separate company? And am I giving away more of um, a percentage in, um, you know, interest, interest um, if I do that. That's a very long question, and I'm going to give you a short answer because I'm aware of the times. Okay, so when it comes to the way you're going to structure it between your companies, you're going to sit down and work out what's best for you, but don't let that hold you back whatsoever, okay? Then what you'll be doing, you'll be talking with your mortgage broker and you're talking to your accountant and you're looking at the best way to do it. But what you can't lose sight of, and that's what we lose sight of when we're talking about interest rates, no offence, is by title splitting it, you're getting a 20 to 30% uplift in value. So if that uplift in value is giving you 100 or 200,000 pounds, even if it costs your lawyer stamp duty a bit of interest, the uplift will, will be more than the cost of doing it. Does that make sense? Because it was a long, a long question, but I know we're short on time. Yeah. So yes, I, okay. I did a short answer. Is that all right? That's fine. I was just going to say, uh, keep in mind, of course, it's a residential element. When it's a residential element, the rates are lower, is what we're finding. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, let's start with Harriet. Um, opportunities for small time. Opportunities. I think, we have to, I think you have to look, whatever your political view is, you have to look at the way the world is changing. You have to look at the fact that we are going to have less cars, whether we have 15 minute cities or not. And you need to prove looking at properties, and there's plenty of them out there. We've talked about it the mixed use, commercial, residential on top, split those titles, take advantage of the buy to let rates, take advantage of the SAS, and just look what people need in that area. Mixed use property, commercial ground floor, two or three flats above, split it out. Can. I would say there's a myth that you can't jump into commercial property. Uh, jumping into development or PD or use class order changes. My view is you absolutely can. Uh, you can start from, I mean, uh, a number of our students, for example, right? Um, she's an opti, opti something, glass person, glasses. Optician. Most nerv yeah, they're one of them. She's, a, she's, a, she's you know, the most nervous character you would ever find. However, she's done a development in Oxford and just by the planning permission has raised 300,000 pounds as soon as she got the planning permission. She's never done a development before. So it's a myth that you need to go, I used to think you have to go step by step by step. As long as you are following the steps of how to do it properly, you can jump into this stuff if you're not already. In fact, what I've done is I've actually created some resources for new developers. Um, if you would like them, you can take my email. It's cam with a K, K-A-M at premierproperty.co.uk. Email me and just type in the word resources and I'll get my team to send them to you. Okay. You can do that now. Amy. Yeah, um, just very quickly on your finance side, just make sure you, you've spoken to your lender and you've got your finance lined up. 
interest rates are rising and, and they are and there's no stopping it and they, and they are for everyone so the last thing you want to do is go and get a 10 percent rate from a lender and then the the, the yield from the rent is not going to cover your, your monthly payments on that so make sure you've got your lending lined up and also make sure you've you've done your research because a lot of people who are going to get a buy properties they'll buy it and then we'll get a valuation done and they're just nowhere near you need to make sure you've you've researched the valuer you've researched the area they're going to look at comparables you've looked at what the rental income is make sure you've done your research on that as well so I hope is, that's, is uh, it all right on. if i just on, mention the fact that um anybody wants to know more about what we do uh, me and rachel are back here at 320 doing a half hour presentation you're all welcome to come thank you uh, so i hope that's whetted your appetite for all things commercial property uh, we are in a recession Recessions are always a time where commercial property values are uh, affected. Fortunes are made in recession, and we have never had a recession where, they, where you have had so much uh, freedom to repurpose commercial properties to alternative uses. That's never happened before. So the opportunities in, in property, I believe, are in commercial, but you just got to get educated, you got to get you got to know about it and understand how to spot those opportunities in the first place. So I hope you've enjoyed the panel. Thank you very much to Harriet, Cam and Amy.